After three years and two missed deadlines, we must leave the EU. Britain is in chaos. People are taking to the streets angry, indignant, divided. And it's all because of Brexit. Brexit now! Brexit now! The Conservative government wants out of the European Union as fast as possible, even without a deal and no matter the costs. We're leaving on the 31st of October, no ifs or buts. For supporters of Brexit, a new world of global trade opportunities and reduced immigration beckons. But the UK Parliament has blocked a no-deal scenario. The eyes have it, the eyes have it. Citing official warnings of an economic meltdown and even a shortage of food and medicines. It's going to be an absolute disaster for everybody. The battle between those who want to leave right now and those who want to remain is threatening to undermine British democracy. Stop the coup! Stop the coup! Critics say the Brexiters are guilty of incendiary rhetoric. Once Brexit's done, we'll take the knife to them. Which has created a climate of fear for vulnerable minorities. This is why I'm getting punched. Immigrants and even politicians. And peace, traitors! My guest today is Richard Tice, co-founder and chair of the Brexit Party. We're going to London to stop the Brexit betrayal. A key figure in the Leave campaign, he dismisses predictions of catastrophe as Project Fear. I'm Mehdi Hassan, and I've come here to the Oxford Union to go head-to-head -head with Richard Tice, the British entrepreneur turned politician who's now leading the controversial No Deal Brexit campaign. I'll challenge him on how much responsibility his side takes for the polarising of British society and ask him how on earth could leaving the EU without an agreement be good for Britain's democracy or economy? Tonight, I'll be joined by three experts. Graham Gudgeon, a pro-Brexit economist at Cambridge University and chief economic advisor at the conservative think tank Policy Exchange. He's also the editor of the Briefings for Brexit website. Jonathan Liz, the deputy director for the pro-European think tank British Influence. He's also a political commentator for The Guardian newspaper, Prospect magazine and the BBC, among others. And Ash Sarkar, a senior editor at the progressive online media outlet Novara Media in London. She also teaches political theory at the Sandberg Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Richard Tice. Tice has been a member of the European Parliament since May 2019, when the Brexit party obtained a third of the vote. Richard Tice, thanks for joining me on Head to Head. Pleasure. Since the 2016 EU referendum, uh, there have been three prime ministers, yep. two missed Brexit deadlines, the unlawful suspension of Parliament, the collapse of the pound, and the British people divided like never before. Isn't it the case, Richard, that Brexit has led not just to political chaos, but to the UK becoming the laughing stock of the world? Yes, is a simple word. Uh, I mean, the reality is that's what happens when you have weak, feeble leadership. You know, I'm a businessman, and uh, a, a bad chief executive of a business can ruin it in two years. A bad prime minister can humiliate a country in a couple of years. And that's what we've seen with what happened to Theresa May. As of right now, the UK is in the midst of what many would call a constitutional crisis. Parliament was suspended by the pro-Brexit Prime Minister Boris Johnson. It was then unsuspended by the Supreme Court that said it was null and void. I remember, Richard, people saying, we have to leave the EU because Parliament is sovereign, not the EU, not Brussels. But now, when the UK Parliament blocks Britain crashing out of the EU without an agreement, blocks no-deal Brexit, suddenly you say, Parliament's not sovereign anymore. How convenient. I've never said Parliament's sovereign. The people are sovereign. They lend that sovereignty to Parliament. And the disgraceful thing about what happened over the last 40 years is that Parliament then lent uh, that sovereignty uh, to an overseas power, to the European Union, without the people's consent. And more and more and more power was permanently given to Brussels. Every political scientist, including the ones in universities like this one, as well as the Supreme Court of this country, says Parliament is sovereign. That's been a bedrock of British politics for decades, for centuries before you and I were born. But when you say you've never said it, you're, the group you founded, Leave EU, 
said in October 2015, less than a year before the referendum, and I quote, vote to leave the EU to ensure lawmaking power returns to our sovereign national parliament. That's what you were saying back then. As soon as that sovereign parliament passes a law on Brexit you don't like, it's not sovereign anymore. No, I don't think that's very right. convenient. No, I, look, I, I tell you what, Parliament is, is, is considerably more sovereign than giving it to the European Union. But fundamentally, the people are sovereign, as I said. So, they, so they, your group they, they was wrong it. to say in October no, wasn't, 2015 wasn't wrong? No, no. Well, it said a sovereign national parliament? Yeah, because the Parliament passes laws. Yes. So it's been lent the sovereignty for a four or five year period yeah. to pass laws yes. until it hands back that sovereignty to the people. So it's passed a law now year. saying Britain cannot exit by October 31st yeah. unless there's a deal. And, and presumably the government will have to abide but by that. That's a legitimate law, law in your view. Legitimate, yes. I mean, yes. Parliament's passed the law, so yeah. And the know. Prime Minister should follow the law? If he breaks the law, because he suggested he's going to exit For sure. regardless. For sure. Would you support him breaking the law? No, of course not. OK. Even if you're right that Parliament isn't sovereign, that the public will somehow trumps parliamentary legislation, which, as I say, goes against political traditions in this country. Well, you say that, but actually that's what a referendum's about. Exactly. Because a referendum that's, is where Parliament... That was the case for a referendum. Parliament has outsourced the decision to the people. They did In an advisory time. referendum. No, hang on. No, no, let's be very clear. It was an advisory referendum. Forget all that nonsense. It's not right? nonsense. It, it was an nonsense. advisory referendum, was it They not? said, they sent out a nine million pound leaflet to every house in the, the country. The government sent out a said, leaflet, but the law, the EU Referendum Act 2015, made it very clear it was an advisory well, referendum. Your have, leader, Nigel Farage, just said it was an advisory people referendum. People have a right to trust what the government writes to them Agreed. About, but, okay? that, but it wasn't, people, but under law, it was an advisory referendum. Can we agree on that as a fact? Let, let's agree on that. But if you okay. write to the people, Fair you point. say that um, we will implement yep. your decision, and it's a once-in-a-generation decision, and you then renege on that, it's not surprising we face the biggest lack of trust, betrayal of trust so, in democracy in this country. Given we're in this chaos right now, and given that you know, there's this argument over who is legitimate, where does sovereignty lie, as we're finding in this conversation, why not then let the public decide how to resolve this mess that we're in by holding another vote. I mean, if you'd lost the last referendum campaign, 52% to 48%, instead of winning it, as you did, 52% to 48%, you would have been calling for another referendum now no, too, wouldn't. wouldn't you? No, we wouldn't, and we wouldn't be where we are. I mean, that's just a complete nonsense. Really? Well, why did Nigel the... Farage, the leader of your party, say in May 2016, a month before the referendum, in a 52-48 referendum, this would be unfinished business by a long way? I don't know. I'm not Nigel Farage. I didn't hear him say it. Look, the reality is... All right. The, the way... Richard, Richard, let's, Richard. Let's, let's hold on, hold on, hold on. No, the no, way no, that the quotes let's, work, let's, whether let's you heard them clear. or not, is irrelevant. Yeah, he did say it to the mirror. He's never denied saying it. Fine. He said it would be unfinished business by a long way. You can't but, just disown the leader the of way, your party the way when he says something awkward. The way democracy works is that you have elections every five years, yeah. right? So if you lose an election, yeah. you try and do better the next time. But you have a thing called loser's consent. Yes. And, and your party leader said he would not abide really by that important. if you lost. Democracy only works in this country yeah. if, if losers accept they lost. Completely agree. Okay? And right. yet your they leader lost. said, your leader you said just, if the Remain campaign... I'm you quoting your leader, I'm not giving you any of my views. If the Remain campaign wins two-thirds to one-third, that ends it. You didn't win one, two thirds to one third, so it's not over, according to Nigel Farage. I don't have to agree with every word that he said. Look, if you want to review the referendum 10, 15 years down the track, that's fine. Happy, but you, know, you have to implement the will of the people first time round. In the same way, when well, you what have. What is a... the will of the people? That's what I'm saying. The will of the it's people the is decision. not written, It's not etched in stone. People get to change their minds, don't they? We don't they? have a general election and then say, oh, I didn't like the results, so can we have another vote? Really? We just had one in 2017 and we might have one next month. That's in two years. <laughs> but, but the reality is. Yeah, but hang on. But what happened after that election? Theresa May won it, just, with a hung parliament, with the DUP, so she's the Prime Minister, right? Yeah. And she and tried to get out, she tried to get out three times, she put a deal, and you disagreed with that deal. Because it was a terrible Brexit. deal, it was the worst deal It doesn't in matter, it was Brexit, that's what you no, wanted, it wasn't you Brexit. should have got behind it. it. We've always said that's not Brexit, that is, that's half in, half oh, out. Oh, so what you're Shake saying, Richard, is that there are multiple forms of Brexit. Listen, which was, weren't on the ballot paper in 2016. Mehdi, there was leave on the, yes, on the ballot paper. It wasn't, it wasn't leave and subject to a deal. Leave? You or Theresa May? Well, I mean, let's be honest, leave means leave. That's why I founded the group. Well, by definition, it doesn't and mean that. That's why we're in this mess. It you does. can repeat three words, but it means nothing. We'll talk about that beyond three words in a few moments. It's but before simple. we do... Keep it simple, folks. Before we, do, before we do, just something that's been a big story here in the UK recently. Um, given an anti-Brexit MP, Joe Cox, was murdered in the middle of the referendum campaign by a white nationalist who considered her to be a collaborator and a traitor, do you think it's wise right now that politicians constantly talk of betrayal, of traitors, of surrender? 
leader. Isn't it irresponsible for your party leader, Nigel Farage, to talk about picking up a rifle if Brexit isn't delivered, of taking a knife to civil servants in London? Is this not dangerous stuff, Richard? Look, the word surrender is a normal part of the English language, just like betrayal. If we can't use simple language like that, then actually you are preventing free speech. You know... No one's banning oh, you from on. saying it. No one's hold on. No one's banning you from saying it. We're saying we're saying when you hear when you hear Thank women you. in Parliament saying they're getting death threats citing the prime Which minister's words, isn't that doesn't that make you feel yeah. grotesque? The Joe Cox murder was absolutely hideously yeah. shocking and appalling. Um, I've never said. Don't we want to avoid another one happening by of all course. moderating our language? Of course. How about picking up a rifle and knifing civil servants? What about Ed Davey saying he wanted to decapitate the prime well, minister? When, when Ed Davey comes on the show, I'll ask him about it. I'm asking Perfect. you about you Nigel that. Farage. Look. We can do what about them all day. I'm asking you to comment. I use my own language. Rifle. I'm my own person. I'm not responsible for other you, people's I mean, comments. you're chair of the Brexit party. You actually yeah. are responsible for what Nigel Farage says. He's the leader of your party. That's how it works. Otherwise, yeah, you don't have to be the chair in, of In it. politics, you don't dictate what other people say. You don't, but you have a comment and, and, on it. Let's just actually, be clear. Do you disagree with the language of rifle and knifing? It, look, it's not language I would have used. Why? Right? I'd choose different language. That's Why? absolutely fine. Is what I'm wondering. Why? Because I'm my own person. Because there's something wrong with what Farage said, Every, right? Everybody's different. OK. So you're OK with that language? I'm just trying to get clear. Are you OK with it or well, not OK Everybody's with different. I would use different language. That's fine. OK. Let's bring in our, our panel here, who are waiting patiently to come in. Jonathan Liz is the deputy director of the pro-European think tank British Influence. He's also a, a journalist, contributor to The Guardian, Prospect, among others. Jonathan, you've called this new rhetoric the end of playing by the rules. You say people have every right to be scared. Richard makes the point that there's people on your side of the argument using some pretty heated rhetoric too. No one is using uh, language which would incite violence on, on my side of the debate. No one is accusing anyone of treason. And when they're in, if they ever did, then I would completely disavow that. What we are seeing now is a very Trumpian style approach where there's an attempt to reframe language and to normalize that reframing because in order to take control of the people, you have to take control of their lexicon. Let me bring in uh, Graham Gudgeon, who's a pro-Brexit economist at Cambridge University, chief economic advisor at the Conservative think tank Policy Exchange. Uh, Graham, you've been a big supporter of Brexit. Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the UK at the time of this recording, has said that he will take Britain out of the EU on the 31st of October. He's dodged questions of legality, whether he would be breaking the law. Would you support that? Are you someone who says, we've got to do Brexit no matter what Parliament passes? Oh, absolutely. We, we've got to get this done now. This has just gone on far too long. Com companies are in trouble. They, they don't know what to do. There are big investments to make. Even if it involves breaking the law, just to be clear, I want to know where you stand. There's no, a law that says he cannot do this. No, I don't think you should break the, break the law, but, but the law itself, the Ben Act, is just ridiculous. It effectively hands over the power to the EU. Since we're not allowed to accept no deal, the EU can offer us any deal that they, they want, yep. and they can offer us any timescale they want. And then the Remainder Parliament can say, OK, we'll accept that. Thank Otherwise you known as the Parliament. The Parliament of the United Kingdom, which is sovereign, as we've established. You, you have surrendered the key issue of how long we remain in the to European Parliament, Union. No, 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 to Parliament the European Union. I mean, it's just like... The EU makes suggestions, Parliament can accept okay. or reject it. Let's bring in Ash Sarkar, senior editor of the progressive online media outlet Novara Media. She also teaches political theory at the Sandberg Institute. Ash, is the language around Brexit, is it, is it as toxic as people seem to suggest it is? Well, you know what, I think it's important to use passionate terms for when you feel passionately about politics. I do have a specific question for you, though, because a few weeks ago, one of your parliamentary candidates for South Northamptonshire, Rachel Warby, tweeted that she totally agreed with a list calling for me, personally, to be either executed or imprisoned. Do you think that this is appropriate conduct? No, I don't think that's appropriate. And so I will, will clearly she still tell be a candidate? Well, I'll have to look at it and make a form of you. I mean, do you have a code of conduct about this kind of thing? Of course we do. And is, and is calling for only, political only, opponents to be executed against that code of conduct? Well, look, I, I will look at it, of course, and I will give you that, uh, I will give the assurance, right? We have withdrawn the whip from one of our MEPs because of uh, a conflict of interest between his business interests and his role as an MEP. Very, very briefly, is that it seems to me that there's a pattern of behaviour when it comes to using language around violence by Brexit party supporters, including Nigel Farage. I remember the day of the referendum result. They boasted that it had been won without a single bullet being fired, merely days after the murder of Joe Cox. So my next question would be, these Brexit party supporters, who um, radicalised them look, and where? It's, it's, look, it's a big divisive moment. <laughs> so... So what about, what about Ed Davey the other day? It's OK for Remainers to say it, is it? Let me ask you quick, before we move on, very quickly. If you agree, as you say you do, we all agree that we want to reduce the likelihood of, God forbid, another attack or a murder of, of a member course. of Parliament happening, what, give me your top proposal for uh, creating a Britain where that doesn't happen. What would you like to see happen? 
get this job sorted so we can actually try and unify the country about a successful economic performance afterwards so no, that we can then move on. Nothing about rhetoric, people's rhetoric. You don't look, think any rhetoric look, should change. This is such a divisive issue. Let's implement it and then we can all move on. You talk about implementation, Richard. You're running on a platform to leave the European Union without a deal, whether on October the 31st or beyond. Uh, but just going back to 2016, when your side was telling the British people uh, that they could leave the EU with a great deal, uh, with a trade agreement in place, it yep. would be easy. So I'm wondering, were you deliberately misleading them back then? Were you gaslighting them? Or were you ignorant about how difficult Neither. it was going to be? Which one is it? Neither. What was it then? Why did you make those promises? Why? Because actually, if we'd had proper leadership from someone who believed in Brexit, we would have got that. You didn't say vote leave, you it'll can't. be great, unless there's a bad prime minister that I don't like. You didn't add that little asterisk caveat. Yeah, and, and, and we didn't say leave subject to a deal that everybody likes. We said leave. You went on the BBC in the run-up to the referendum and you promised the viewers that the UK would, quote, still have a friendly agreement negotiated with the EU in the two years after we vote no. It's been three. And frankly... You said on the economics, it'll yeah. be broadly the same. That's what you told people. And the good news is it's going to be even better. It no, it's not, wrong. it's not wrong. It's going to be even better. And do you know what? If I'd been negotiating it, we would have had a deal and we would have been out right now. Hold on. Even Michael Gove, Conservative Cabinet Minister, one of the leaders oh, of the Vote Leave yeah. campaign, who's, he said, he said, and I quote, we didn't vote to leave without a deal. That wasn't the mass message of the campaign I helped lead. He's being honest about it. Why not just he's own not, it? Why not he's just not say, being yeah, you know honest what? About it. We got it wrong. He's not being honest about it. Here's a man who, a few months ago, said, you know, that we were leaving with a good deal, Theresa May's deal. Now he's in charge of, you know, leaving without a deal or a clean break Brexit. And he's saying, that's absolutely fine. I mean, you just can't trust a word that man says. But OK, you don't know so, what he but says. can we trust what you... But what I tell but you... Can we trust you? I tell you what, you can, can trust, trust what I you? say. Yes. Can we trust Nigel Farage? Yes. So when you, when you, you and Farage and Aaron Banks, who was the big donor to the Leave EU Who's campaign, got nothing when, to do... Hang but on, he was a big donor to the Leave EU campaign. I'm talking yeah, about but, the referendum right now. When you were saying in the referendum, three of you, Norway, free trade agreement. None of that's on the table now. Now you're telling us to forget all that. Maybe, Why not just own it? Why pretend you were always for a no deal slash clean break? So what did Michel Barnier say at the beginning of the negotiations? He said, if you want a simple free trade deal, you can have one. Theresa May rejected it. And that's why we're in the mess we are. Only, it's interesting, isn't it? Only last week, Michel Barnier had a meeting with one of my colleagues, uh, one of my Brexit party MEPs, and he said, if we leave, with, a, with no deal, with a clean break Brexit, then they will start negotiating a free trade deal the following week. I mean, you know what The Economist is saying. You know what the Office of Budget Responsibility said about... They're the same people who said that we'd go into immediate recession, we'd lose half a million jobs. Who said the pound would collapse, and it did. And we're employing a million people more than we did at the time of the referendum. And We've you... got the lowest rate of unemployment. And... We're uh... outperforming the Eurozone. The... Hold, on, hold, on, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. One of the members of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England says already the cost of Brexit is running at £40 billion pounds a year. Have... The IMF, which last time I checked didn't vote in the referendum, them, said but, the but total said negative effect crisis. on UK GDP is about 3.5% by 2021. The IMF so, led by Christine uh, Lagarde, yeah. right, who said that there was going to be a complete collapse. So, so no it. IMF. What about, about the, the British retail consortium that says prices will go up in supermarkets after a no-deal Brexit? There'll be a shortage of food. And they won't. They won't. They'll so the people down. who run... So you know more than the person who runs Sainsbury's and Tesco's? Yes, frankly. You know more than the Bank of England? Because... You know more than I the IMF? I know more than the Bank of England because he's, at, he's, you know, he's useless. Well, okay. Every decision he's made about the interest rates has been totally and utterly wrong. When we leave on a clean break, we can then make the decisions about what tariffs we cut. So we can cut the tariffs of goods that we don't produce in this country, consumer goods, food, You know you have footwear. to do that for everyone, right, under World yes. Trade Organization yes. rules? But if we don't... So you're going to so yes. reduce tariffs on everything? No, on goods that we don't produce. I've been to the WTO, I've met very senior people there, and they said, right, uh, I went to them back in January, and they said, yes, you could easily turn the 29-page political declaration into an Article 24, heads of terms, and actually that would be a sensible thing to do, given where it's at. Who did you meet at the WTO? I met a couple of the very senior managers. What are their names? I'm not going to give you the names now. Well, I'm telling you, the Director General of the WTO, Robert yep. Azevedo, says there will be costs, and the costs may be very significant and in the, some sectors. Yeah, but what His did... predecessor, Pascal Lamy, who ran the WTO yeah. before him, says you'd be brutally jumping from Trade League 1 to Trade League 3. That's the Director General of the WTO and his predecessor, but two anonymous people you met have guaranteed you things will be fine. No, I, I did, don't put words into my mouth. That's not what I said. You literally just said I went and met two I officials. Didn't, I didn't. And they said we can make this happen. I asked you their names. You said I can't tell me them. I didn't say. I just. They actually asked me not to say their names. If you really want to know. Okay. Right. No, but the reality is, they said what would what you know what they thought we could do and should do. 
I think that's absolutely right. We've always said that we should ask for an Article 24 heads of agreement under the WCO rules, which basically means you agree the heads of terms, you then basically in corporate terms, you put it into solicitors' hands, and you and dot the I's happen. and cross the T's. You know that can't happen. That's abs really the, the fundamental point of an agreement is the two sides have to agree. Of course, now, that's, the the whole, that's how a heads of terms EU works. is not going to agree to have a cherry-picked heads of terms trade agreement if we don't give the EU what they want, which is citizens' rights, the divorce payment, and the Irish backstop. The EU has always had more leverage in the UK because it's Why? bigger, it's more powerful, it's rich than we are, they can afford to walk away, Richer we can't, we and that is the truth of Brexit. Let me bring in, let me bring in, without, let our, me bring without in Graham. 39 billion, they are almost bust. Okay, let me ask you this, Graham. The Yellowhammer document from the government also has predicted possibly shortage of medicines, foods, disruption at the border, delays. Are you willing to concede that or no? I, I urge everybody to look at that Yellowhammer document. It's only five pages. It won't take you very long. It is the most ridiculous document yeah, yeah. I, 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 have, I have ever, yeah, yeah. ever read. It's not... Um, it's utter garbage. It, it's not a prediction. It's what, they, it's what they call a worst case scenario. Well, actually, they called it, they called it a base scenario and uh, then they renamed it, when it got, after well, it got if, leaked, if as you know. If they'd have kept the base case scenario, it, it would have been beyond ridiculous. It would be I mean, this is an internal planning document yeah. from a pro-Brexit government, let, let, just to be clear. But they're part of the Remain conspiracy yeah. as well. Let, let me tell you what this analysis was based on. And this is just quotes from the document. It's not, 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 not my view. If between 50 and 85% of haulage companies are unable to fill in French customs forms, not only on the first day, but for three months, and then half of them are unable to fill in these forms for, for six months, then we'd have problems. Now, the French customs, and indeed our own customs, have been handing out forms to lorry drivers for the last six months on, okay, on so what... Just, just, why, just, why, why would 85% of our haulage companies be unable I'm just asking, are you to... saying there won't be any disruption after a no-deal no, Brexit? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying there'll be a... If there's any disruption, it'll be fairly small. Jonathan, very briefly respond to that. There will be a small disruption. Well, I mean, look, the government is, as you say, a pro-Brexit government. I say listen to the actual government, which has no interest in, in uh, ramping up the dangers of no deal. They are saying that terrible things can happen. We have a duty, a responsibility to listen to those risks and pay attention. How could anyone read that document and approve no deal is completely beyond me. Ash, I just want to bring you on on something... I want to bring you in on something Richard said about... Hold on, Richard, I'll bring you back in a second to respond. Just, just one thing. Is that fair now when you hear all the debates in British politics about we were misled, we should rerun the vote, they weren't fully honest with us, etc. Advisor reference. Where do you stand on all that? I'm, I'm what you'd call a Eurosceptic Remainer, which means that I alienate everyone and no-one likes me. <laughs> For me, I... There are very strong arguments about why Brexit should happen, and I think the main one is the democratic principle, which is when you vote for something, regardless of what the letter of the law says about it yeah. being advisory or not advisory, um, our political system relies on the trust of the electorate, and I do think that there is a, a negative consequence for breaking that trust. Yeah. I do also, however, think that there is no mandate for no deal. There was, when Parliament voted to trigger Article 50, Parliament has since changed its mind, which is the right of Parliament. But I've got a really simple... Correct. No, I agree I've, with I've, you on I've that. got a very, very simple question for you, and it's really straightforward. Very I know that you don't hold truck with what's in the Yellow Hammer reports, but it says two things. One is that lowest-income families are likely to be hardest hit by the disruption, and second is that there may be some shortages of medicine. Now, I know you think that none of that's going to happen. Correct. But if you could just put a number on it for me. How many job losses are worth Brexit happening, and how many deaths from medicine shortages oh. for you are oh. worth Brexit that is, happening? That's... Ash, frankly, that question is beneath you. The great thing is we're one, actually going to get more ten. jobs because it's going to be a huge success. But how right? many, and how let me come many back to jobs the medicines. are worth the risk? Because it's not your job at risk. I've just told you, we've well, created a million jobs. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, okay, I'm going to come on to the medicines point. No, no, this is really good. important. Briefly. So, um, th this, this ridiculous suggestion that, you know, we're going to have a medicines shortage... Let's just think, folks. You know, one of our MEPs was with four French pharmaceutical companies just a fortnight ago, and every single one of those executives from those companies, French pharmaceutical companies, said, it's completely ridiculous, of course we're going to keep selling, and of course there'll be plenty of medicines. Let me ask you this question before we take a break. If you're wrong about the medicines issue and the disruption, the shortage of food, I just want to know, how do people hold you to account for that? Here well, and now. In an election. That's how elections work. Okay. You know, if politicians stand up and say something, Fine. Right, and I'm quite happy to stand up and say, because that's you're very my confident. View. That you yeah, know, I'm confident. You know more about that's retailers and retailers. Right, you know my more glass about is always half full, it's never that. half empty. Fine. I'm a positive, optimistic sort of guy. I think. I mean, that, there's a fine line between optimism and delusion, isn't there? That's the, that's the worry always. Yeah. If maybe experts are maybe all I'm the optimist, maybe you're deluded. Okay.
We will have to take a break there. You're watching Head to Head. We will be back in part two with Richard Tice and our panel and our very patient audience here in the Oxford Union to discuss what's happening with British public opinion. Is it more divided than ever before? And what's the future for Richard's Brexit party? Join us after the break. You're watching Head to Head on Al Jazeera English. My guest today is the businessman turned politician, Richard Tice, who's chair of the Brexit Party, and we're talking about, what else? Brexit. Uh, Richard, a lot of minorities in this country, people of colour, immigrants, feel as if racism and xenophobia has gone up since the 2016 referendum. And a lot of the official stats on hate crimes, on racist attacks, a lot of the polls seem to support that view. Given the Leave campaign ran an overtly nationalistic campaign, some would say xenophobic campaign, is it any surprise to you that racism and racist attacks have gone up in Britain in recent years? Look, I think, uh, you know, to the extent that they have, uh, then, you know, that's a, that's a tragedy. And, of course, you know, no one should welcome that. You know, my view on immigration has always been that this country has been very good at welcoming immigration, but you have to have sensible immigration that works for your economy. And in the last 10 years, we've had immigration of over a quarter of a million a year, and actually we've had zero real wage growth for the least well-off in society. Okay. And, you know, that's what happened. And, and people felt so anxious about that. What you're saying is a very legitimate view. Many politicians, many people in the public hold that view about immigration. But it's more about the tone. For example, that breaking point poster that some will remember here that was run, uh, that Nigel Farage unveiled uh, during the referendum campaign that had, in some people's views, Nazi undertones. I mean, Michael Gove, who co-chaired the Vote Leave campaign, the other Leave campaign, said he regrets the very harsh anti-immigrant, anti-foreigner uh, aspect of the campaign. Do you? Yes, some stuff was said that probably shouldn't have been said. You know, some of the stuff was difficult. It was tough. Do you um, include the Breaking Point poster? I think that was tough and, you know, it, it was a tragic, tragic... Was it racist? Day. Was it racist? Different people have different views. What do you think? <laughs> I mean, I've invited Actually, you no, here. Was it racist? Fine. You tell me what your view is. I don't think it was. Why? Why? I just don't think it was. It was a picture that had appeared, let's remember, on all sorts of newspapers in previous weeks. Uh, the campaign you co-founded, Leave yep. EU, is still active. You've quit that campaign. I, you have to be very uh, clear, I left that just after the reference. Yes. Since then, it's been accused of anti-Semitism when it posted an image of a Jewish billionaire, George Soros, as a puppet master with Tony Blair. It's been accused of Islamophobia after it posted an image of London Mayor Sadiq Khan next to the words Londonistan and Islamic fundamentalism. Do you condemn those anti-Semitic Islamic images by your... Islamophobic images look, by as your former organisation? As I've said, look, you can't be held responsible for an organisation's actions. I'm not holding you responsible. I'm asking you, do you condemn them? Yeah, I don't like it. I wouldn't have done it if I was involved. OK. But, you know, I'm not involved. OK. I think it's really interesting, isn't it, how people try and continue to discredit and smear someone, even though they've got nothing to do with an organisation. Who, who's discrediting well, you? You've just tried to... I infer. literally asked you a question. Do you condemn, if I yeah, set up an organisation and they did bad things after I left and somebody said, do you condemn it? I say, yeah, that wasn't yeah, the organisation I ran. Yeah, I condemn it. Yeah, and I don't like it. You're not condemning me, so I don't like it. OK, let's talk about your current party, the Brexit party. Nigel Farage is a man... Uh, the most famous Brexiter in Britain, I think it's fair to say. You've compared him to Gandhi and Mandela in this very chamber, I believe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and actually, he... he yeah, and, and I have to say, in terms, in terms of delivering lasting change... OK. Absolutely. <laughs> OK. Well, let's be honest. Well, Brexit, Brexit is a huge opportunity, okay. a seismic shift in the way this country is going to be run. But let me just finish my question. That is lasting change. Let me just finish my question before, before they turn in their graves further. Um, he has a long history of complaining about foreign languages being spoken on the train, Romanians moving in next door to him, immigrants causing traffic jams, a powerful Jewish lobby. Can you really blame people for calling Farage as a leader of your party and your party itself xenophobic, or even racist, based on that kind of language? Yeah, well, I just... I just fundamentally don't agree. I mean, you know, you only look at the Brexit party, right? We've got more diversity uh, amongst our MEPs than any other party in the European Parliament. That doesn't cancel out. If you have, if, if you have we, lots if, of if black we, candidates, if, if it we doesn't mean you can make we comments about party, Romanians. It's not like a get-out-of-jail free card that you look, get. Look, if we were a racist party, would we have that diversity in... I didn't say you're a racist party. I said, you can just, you blame... You just inferred, no, you no, just inferred no, it. I, I said, can you blame people for thinking you're racist when your leader says yes, he has yes. problems with Romanians moving in next door to him? Yeah, I do blame people. People say they look at that and they say that's racist. You're saying they're wrong to say that. I'm saying, fine. I don't think that's racist. We are not a racist party. Do you have a problem with the Romanians moving in next door to you? 
basically no. I mean, you know... I, it, <laughs> What? Okay, no, I'm just checking. Yeah. yeah I don't, because he does, so I'm just checking. Um, but it's not just Farage. Your former colleague and party leader, Catherine Blakelock, who co-founded the Brexit party, was forced to resign because she said, Islam is equal to slavery, Muslim men were impregnating white British girls to create Muslim babies, and she retweeted a leading UK neo-Nazi dozens of times. She recently compared Clapham to the Caribbean and said the Tower Hamlets look like Pakistan. Yeah, the and, founder and, of your party. And, and those are, you know, those are outrageous things to say, and that's why she left the party almost as the, the moment it was set up, when which those is, things which were discovered. Is, which, credit to your party for getting rid of much. her. But then she's the founder of your party. That's a bit uh, dodgy. She's not just some random uh, passerby. Yeah, but that's why we got rid of her. But why did you let her set up the party? You well, didn't know she was a I racist. Wa I wasn't involved in that moment. Nigel chose someone to set up the party. He, maybe he didn't know what she was saying or tweeting or doing. OK. But Farage won't be leaving any time soon. Well, no. No? And he, you know, the idea that he's racist is just wrong. It's just plain wrong. I know the bloke, he's, he's not. It's as simple as that. Is it as simple as that? I just gave it a bunch of things that. that he said. OK. All right, fine. I, I know him okay. better than you, and I'm telling you, he's not a racist. Okay. I, I'll be honest, I'm glad you know him better than I do. Um, let's go to our panel here, who are listening. Ash Sarkar is a senior editor at Novara Media. She also teaches political theory at the Sandberg Institute. Um, Ash, in your view, since the Brexit referendum took place in June 2016, has racism gone up in the UK, and can it be attributed to a single figure or campaign or movement or political... Is that too simplistic? Well, tell you what, I'll give you an example of something that happened to me the day after the referendum campaign. Uh, I took a walk with my friend in the morning and someone uh, leaned into both of our faces and called me a brown C word. And then later on that day, a group of men got in my face and started yelling Brexit, right? So for them, that meant something when they saw an Asian woman. And then since then, uh, I've experienced more racism just walking around London than I have before in my life. And my experiences are also backed up by statistics. You have huge increases in reported racist hate crimes. Now, I'm not saying that it's caused by Brexit. I'm not saying that anyone who supports Brexit is racist. But what I want to know is what your explanation is for why so many racists seem to feel that the Brexit result validated their hateful and bigoted views and why they feel so able to act on them. It's appalling. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. There is, you're absolutely right, there's, there is zero justification. It's appalling and utterly condemn it, and I'm deeply sorry that you had those experiences, of course. But it seems to me that it's easy for you to condemn it when it's a random on the street, but when it's the leader of your party, suddenly you're bending over backwards and contorting to explain why... I'm not bending over backwards and contorting, I'm just saying he's not... I'm just saying, you know, he's not a racist. I know the bloke, he's not a racist. OK, let's go, let's go to... Uh, Graham Gudgeon is a pro-Brexit economist at Cambridge University, chief economic advisor to the Think Tank Policy Exchange. Uh, Graham, you were saying in part one that in addition to being a, a proud... Uh, Brexit support, you're also an academic, you have to look at the evidence. When there's a 22% rise since 2016 in the number of ethnic minorities reporting racism, discrimination that they've experienced, is that causation, correlation? How do you link that to the EU referendum in your view? I mean, I think there's always problems when there's rapid cultural change uh, in, in, in a society. It's the a, it's a speed which, which matters. There's a great majority in the UK, and it's not just uh, uh, leavers, actually. It's a, lo a lot of Remainers as well agree with the idea that you have to control migration. That doesn't mean necessarily that you have to diminish it. In Australia, they've actually increased immigration af after they controlled it because people relax. They think if it's controlled... Well, Australia's another country where racist attacks have gone up, so it's not exactly the best example to give in defence. <laughs> yes, but the migration that, that we're going to control in the UK is European migration from European countries. It, in, in a sense, the same European race. If that's controlled, I think we'll, we'll, probably, we'll probably experience larger immigration from India, the Middle East, uh, and other places. That hardly suggests that this is a racist policy. We I don't think we said anything about the policy. I think we were talking about the people involved. Um, Jonathan Liz is the deputy director of the pro-European think tank British Influence. Uh, Jonathan, the language, the rhetoric, the, language, the rise in racism. The language Do you blame your opponents for that or no? Look, we have to look at the, the referendum campaign from 2016, which was overtly Islamophobic. I remember the posters saying, Turkey, population 80 million in brackets, is about to join the EU, and a series of footsteps leading to an open door. That was a naked attempt to terrify Middle England into voting for Brexit on Islamophobic grounds. And you had another poster, not from your organisation, from Vote Leave, which had Turkey highlighted with Iraq and Syria on a map next to them. Now, if that wasn't Islamophobic, and a mainstream Islamophobic discourse, I don't know what was. So, to, to somehow... 
To someone no, no. say that it was no, nothing to do with us yeah. is complete humbug. Well, the good news is oh, that Jonathan right. and I, we agree on something, right. that it, it, you know, that poster didn't come from us. Um, uh, but let's just remember, it was government policy at the time. David Cameron's policy at the time was for Turkey to join yeah. the European Union. That's actually not true. It, it is absolutely, absolutely true, Jonathan. Also, you know it's, it's true. No, I was, Don't I was, lie. Richard, I'm not lying. I worked in the European Parliament. I worked in the Foreign Affairs Committee where Turkish membership was, was discussed government, on a weekly basis. It was basis, UK government and policy. everyone, if you went to Brussels, you would know that Turkey was not joining for decades, if ever. So it was simple a lie that I would throw back at you. And the other point, for a minister to go on, Penny, as Penny Morden did on television and say that Britain actually had no veto over Turkish membership was simply another way to terrify people into voting for Brexit. How can we possibly say this is a legitimate vote? I, I, I've got to move on, but I... I just want to... I'm just going to make the point again. It was UK government policy under David Cameron so, for Turkey on, I'm, I'm to join the European Union. I'm confused. Are you saying the Turkey poster was or wasn't bad? It was, you know, it was tough. Some tough stuff was done. You say tough, other people say racist. Where's the gap between tough and racist? <laughs> Subjective. It's difficult. Oh, I'm just wondering, where's your, where, does, where does racism begin for you then with those kind of things? It doesn't. It, it, actually, I don't think I don't think those posters were racist, but they, you know they were tough. They were sharp. It was a tough, sharp end to the campaign. Tough and sharp is new euphemisms for what many people regard minimum xenophobic. I'm, allowed to, if I'm allowed to use whatever language I want. Nobody said you're not allowed. I don't know why you Fine. immediately fall. Nobody's stopping well, because, you from saying anything. Because you're you attacking the language I use. I've asked you to define your language. Your terms are very loose. Tough and sharp. There's nothing describe... loose about tough and sharp. It's pretty clear, actually. Is it as clear as Brexit means Brexit? Yes, it is. And it's because... <laughs> as clear as leave means leave. Leave means leave. Yeah, I love it. You see, you're, you're, one of these, you're one of these who still thinks that it was leave subject to a deal. It wasn't. It was leave. Yeah, I'm foolish enough to watch the man go on BBC in 2016 called Richard Tice and say, we will get a deal and it will be the same. And if I'd in charge, we would have got to do it. Okay, but we didn't, so therefore we shouldn't leave, according to your logic. Before we go to our very patient audience here in the Oxford Union, one quick question about the Brexit party. We talked in part one a great deal about democracy yep. and the importance of democracy, and yet your own party, the Brexit party, has basically no internal democracy whatsoever. It's run as a company with two directors, you and Nigel yep. Farage, with registered supporters, not members. Yep. Uh, it's run basically as a dictatorship by you and Nigel Farage, isn't it? It's run as a fast-growing tech startup. And hey, folks, you know, at the end of the day, democracy basically is at the ballot box. And actually, it's interesting, isn't it? We've got things done. We're only 25 weeks. I mean, old, I'm sure we've, many we've dictators achieved... get things done around the world. Well, That's what dictators do. Doesn't mean it's a good thing. It's a company. It's a structure. Your friend Aaron Bank says it's almost a dictatorship. At it's the a normal company structure, and people have the they have the option to vote for it at the ballot box. And interestingly, isn't it? When they had that option, they voted for it, and we're in, we won a national election, securing 50% more votes than anybody else. So maybe actually people are focused on the the opportunity of Brexit, not. I mean, the you won 30% of the vote, a third of the vote. 50% more than any other party. But a third of the vote. I mean, there's a great use of statistics there. But a third of the vote. We won. Let's go to our audience who want to come in now. Um, let's go to someone. Else at the back. Lady there with her hand up. You're a businessman turned politician. Another businessman turned politician comes to mind. That's Donald Trump. Um, one of my frustrations sometimes with people in your position is that I feel that you shirk the social responsibility that comes with some of your policies. So what do you say to people like us who have been told things like go back where you come from when we've only ever lived in this country? Do you have anything to say to us other than I'm so sorry that happened to you? I said it earlier to Ash, and I am very sorry if that happened to you. You know, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm else, straight up. Asking. Of course we have social responsibilities as politicians. I absolutely agree with that. Do you have policies on fighting racism? Yes, we do. What we're, are they? We're, we're completely intolerant of intolerance. No, what's the poli you said you have policies. Well, that is the policy. That's we not a policy, that's just another phrase. What's uh, your definition of a policy? A plan that a government can enact using the powers of the state or the exchequer, changing laws around discrimination, inequality, changing the education system, cracking down on discrimination. And all of those course. follow from Plenty our of three words. I'm not even a politician. All okay. of those follow. All of those follow from our three words. Okay, let's go to this lady here. You to front row. You recently accused RT shock Leo Varadkar of hijacking the Brexit issue, and claimed that the amount of trade crossing the Irish border was, to use your own words, and I quote, irrelevant. Can I say as a point of information, there is no such thing as an Irish land border. It is a UK border imposed on the island of Ireland. The Irish border is the sea. If you think it is irrelevant, can you now speak to the social and political implications to the people of Northern Ireland if a hard border is introduced, if you care so at all? A picture tells a thousand words, right? Think of a glass jar with a thousand smarties in it. I was going to Good. note your analogy, which was horrific, by the way. <laughs> oh, hang on. A thousand smarties. Those smarties represent all of the trade that goes across all the 28 uh, countries uh, in Europe. 
Okay? The trade that goes across that Irish border is between one and two Smarties. It is a tiny, tiny amount. How dare you? This is not about economics. I've asked you about the social and political implications for the people of Northern Ireland if a hard border is introduced. It's not okay. going to be introduced because everybody has said oh, it's not you, going again, to be When you, you say know, everyone's not said it's going to be that's not, you, what, that's, not what the, that's not what uh, Jean Claude Juncker has said. He said there has to be. We can't just have animals coming across well, the border without being checked. You know better than the people of Northern Ireland, the people, the politicians well, of the Republic look, of Ireland. And everybody, the has said, of everybody has said they're not going to impose a hard Border. The head of the police force in Northern Ireland says he worries this could be a trigger for violence. Is he part of a Remain conspiracy as well? I don't... Look, the reality is... Well, you, is... Me, you know more about policing in Northern Ireland than the head no, of the police. No, of course I don't. But, but there is no reason for that to be the case. So when Assistant Chief Constable Barbara Gray, Gray who heads up the counter-terrorism unit in Northern Ireland, says, we predict that a six to 12-month period, if there's a no-deal Brexit, there could be an upsurge in violence. That doesn't worry you at all. Look, of course everybody should be worried if, you know... You don't sound very worried. You just made an analogy about Smarties and we're talking about the return of I'm... violence. <laughs> I, used, I used an economic point. But we're not talking economic. That's what we have to... So let's, let's go back. Let's, let's, about violence. Let's... Before I go back to the audience, let's deal with the violence point. Then we yeah, have to move. no one wants violence. Let's we... be very clear. Yes. But let's go back. But people let's are back. warning of violence, Richard. What do you say to them? I say, why did the head of the EU's own uh, report into the border, Lars Carlson, who had a report called Smart Borders 2, he said that under any situation, any type of deal, there could be a friction-free okay. border. But, but but Juncker has said that's not the case. And, and he's, so I'm going to go, go back to this Varadkar point, because just before he okay, was... Very briefly, because right, the audience are waiting No, but this in. is such a crucial it point. Is. As the lady quite rightly says, under, under Ender Kenny, right? He said, with goodwill, we can find the technological solutions. He had goodwill. Unfortunately, his successor okay. didn't. Many and others he's tried to hijack it. the issue for disgraceful, Brilliant. his own reasons. OK, let's go to the gentleman there. My question is about immigration from the EU to the UK. Couldn't that Northern Ireland border become a choke point? Because anyone in the EU has the right to go to Dublin. There's no visa, no control, no checks. And supposedly, if there's no border, just walk across the border. OK. So my question is, what would you do about that? Would you put up controls between Northern no, Ireland? Nothing, but nothing. But OK, so then there would be free-floating immigration into the UK, then, from the EU. Yeah, there's been a common travel area in Ireland uh, and Northern Ireland for 100 years, and of course that would remain. So you're OK with people coming in from the EU through the frictionless border? You know, that will have... To... Is that what leave means leave? Yeah, look, I, the rea I don't think it'll happen, but to the extent it does, you know, we'll have to look at it. OK, uh, lady here. When we leave, I'm the Brexit Portuguese woman, and I want to know what will happen to my rights. Because the settlement scheme didn't work for me, I gave your country my youth, what will you give me? Um, thank you very much for that question. It's a great question, and... And the scheme is there at the moment, and it sounds like... Have you just recently tried to get settled status? My status was frozen for uh, five months. My embassy is helping me. I felt very frustrated. I'm sure, and I sympathise, and I'm very sorry about that. Because then, since Nigel Farage started to How many, how many to years talk, have you been in the UK? Just for 20. 20 years, and you're now worried about your future post -practice. Yes. Yeah, and... And, uh, Since know, he started to talk, I was attacked, m attacked many times. Hang on, you can't put it on one... You can't put it on... Uh, that's, I'm sorry, you can't I, put it on... I, but I listen, in, straight I, after the referendum, I said the very first thing we should do is we should say that everybody's... Every EU citizen's rights were absolutely guaranteed. I said that on question time in November 16, and I was poo-pooed for it. But, I'd, you know, by, by a Labour MP, actually. So you, but do you but have, I absolutely feel this, that was absolutely this, the right thing to do. This is your right to sort this in your country. It's your country. But if you started the country. conversation by saying the island is full and you didn't differentiate by anybody, then we wouldn't be divided like this. OK. Well, Do you want to respond to that? Then yeah, we're gonna... I, I didn't say the island is full. I've always, I've always said I welcome immigration on a sensible, controlled basis. OK, let's go back to the audience. Gentlemen here, we're waiting in the front. So the Brexit party is claiming to be sort of an answer to Labour in a lot of working class communities. Um, so why was your first policy that you brought out to get rid of, uh, of inheritance tax? Like, who, who are you really, you know, you're working wasn't for big banks? And... Because that wasn't our first policy. Right. Uh, that wasn't our first policy. Our very first policy was actually to invest over 100 billion quid in the regions that have been left behind. We announced it on the 30th of June at our political rally. We said how we're going to pay for it. And actually, you know, it's, it's those regional road and rail schemes okay. that will help the deal, least well off in society. Deal with the inheritance tax point, though. That is a very regressive tax. It helps rich people in this country. That's not really standing up for the left behind, are you? Uh, look, it's, well, it, uh, actually, it's interesting, isn't it? It's the most unpopular, most hated tax in the UK. 
and we think it's we think it's unfair. We think it's egregious. People have saved up. of the benefits from a cut in inheritance tax would go to the richest the states, the states worth over a million pounds. We've got policies on the left, in the middle, and on the right. But that is the most unpopular tax, and we think it would actually it's been pretty well Ash, received very, by middle England. Very briefly, Ash, come in. You I mean, to come very, in. very very quickly, quickly a uh, company that you set up in 1991, uh, Sunley Property Group. Documents passed to me by Open Democracy showed that over 40 percent of it is owned by two firms, one based in Panama, one based in the British Virgin Islands. So why should we trust you on the direction of this country when a company that you set up, most of its dividends, dividends go through tax havens and it's don't contribute to true. this country? Simply not true. I mean, so, so can okay. I ask you a very simple right, question? Because I'm, I'm a UK taxpayer. I was one of the shareholders. There were about a dozen shareholders in that business. Right, they were UK shareholders and they pay UK I'm, I'm tax. Happy to be, I'm happy to be corrected. So Good. one, one very you. quick question. Do you okay. own Sinceria Holdings Limited in Panama okay. or Shuttlecock Holdings Limited right. in the British no. Virgin Islands? Absolutely you nothing. You don't own them? I don't own them. I have nothing to do with You've them. You have nothing to Zero. do with them. Will the Brexit body be, 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 be cracking down on tax havens when it's in office? <laughs> yeah, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because what we believe, we believe in high growth, low taxation. Okay. If you have low taxation in this country, then you reduce the need for people to look at tax avoidance. Okay. Uh, gentleman here in the white shirt. Given that the Vote Leave campaign has been found to have broken electoral law by the Electoral Commission, why should we respect the result of a referendum won by illegal means? Well, firstly, firstly, um, it, it wasn't won by illegal means, right? There was a, there was a lawful referendum, right? Over 30 million people participated in that referendum. The votes were counted, and we won by over a million votes. And then after That's it was the reality. Done, and then after it was done, you were fined right, the maximum amount for overspending. That's cheating, some might say. It's not cheating. Uh, and you get 70 grand, grand on, fine. Can we just, How can is we, that not cheating? We, just on the 70 grand that Leave EU was fined, yep. you paid that fine. Well, I don't know. I'm not involved in Leave.eu. I have no idea. But you were at the time. The, the, the fine covers a period you were in charge of it. I w well, I, w it I, was, I was a co-founder of it. Yeah. I, I genuinely but don't know. But it was fined 70 paid. grand, so you can understand Wait, why some on. Remainers say, come on, this isn't fair, that one of the main and groups campaigning got fined for overspending. Do you understand why people say that, at least? And it's interesting, isn't it? Because Priti Patel, the current Home Secretary, asked the Electoral Commission to investigate why the Remain campaign set up five companies in the last month so they could spend an extra million quid illegally. And the Electoral Commission wouldn't investigate. Why? Because it's okay. deeply biased. But, but just to be clear, Levy, you did pay a 70 grand fine for overspending in your referendum campaign. No one's disputing that, are they? Well, I don't know. You I don't know if they paid a 70 grand fine. It's pretty big news. Because I'm not a director of it. I wasn't involved in it. But you don't need to be involved in it to know what's happening in the news. Well, what a big what story. A, yeah, what I do know you is just they've, missed it. they've subsequently been exonerated, haven't they? They've been... Have they've, they, so they've got the 70 grand back? I, look, I told you, I don't know. What I do know you is the Met know. Police... No, okay. hang on. Hang no, on. You can't pick and choose what you know. I and can, know. because the you, Met Police... I don't know. You selectively... No, no. Suddenly you know about the story, suddenly you don't. It just, well, I, can tell you what, I can tell you what's public information, which is the Met Police and the National Crime Agency have confirmed that Leave.NU did not carry out any illegal criminal activity. Gentlemen here. If Article 50 was to be revoked altogether, what would your prediction be for the future of British politics? Are you someone who wants to see it revoked, not revoked? I voted for Brexit. Uh, I'm 22, uh, from South East London, and I voted for the Brexit party. So. Okay. Do you uh, I, think, I think it would be absolutely disastrous. Trust in democracy in this country would collapse even further than it currently is. I mean, it would be the most appalling thing. Um, let me ask you this one last question before we finish. Let's say you get your wish and this no-deal Brexit slash clean break happens, if not on October 31st, then shortly afterwards. And let's say, I know this is hard for you to hear, you're wrong, and the economists and the Bank of England, the OBR are right, and there's a housing crash, there's a fall in GDP, there's inflation, there's employment. At that point, will you say, nope, it was all still worth it, Brexit was worth the cost? Or will you say, maybe we got this wrong? Well, there's different elements. There's the economic issue, yeah. and I think I'm right. If I'm wrong, people won't vote for us, it's very simple. But there's other issues in terms well, of sovereignty. Yeah, exactly. yeah, in terms of sovereignty, you, we get back our sovereignty from the European Union back to Parliament and back to the people. So that is, you know, that is, that is something that is absolutely priceless. We must achieve that. And, you know... That is priceless, just to be clear. Yeah, if there I was think, a recession, you think, but we got our freedom back. It, yes, it's not a matter. Yeah, I think that's Even priceless. Even though you wouldn't be suffering from that recession. Is that if there's a recession, everybody suffers. Not I the same way, Richard. You won't be suffering as much as some of the low-income communities are hit by it. Well, as I've said before, that actually, if we have a clean break Brexit, we can cut tariffs immediately on the items of, of the goods, that actually uh, reducing those prices will benefit the least well-off 
um, the poorest paid in our society the most, and that's a good thing. On that note, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you to our patient audience in the Oxford Union. Thank you to our panel of experts. Thank you to Richard Tice for coming on Head There. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's our show. Head to Head will be back next week. <laughs>